as you can see, we're talking about the law of God versus the grace of God. And uh, right back in the beginning, God said to Adam, don't eat of the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. He said, don't touch, but they did. And because of that, as God said, you will surely die. And uh, it took a while, it was 930 years when Adam died, but he surely died. It was sort of right from the beginning was this law, if you like, to say if you do this, this is the end result. And we find a bit later on when Noah came on the scene, he found grace in the sight of God. At that stage, God was prepared to destroy the world and start again because mankind had become violent and so on. But God's nature was to save his creation. But mankind couldn't quite fit into what God had in mind. His nature was, as I said, to save. But right in the beginning, God came up with a plan with Abraham. So God was sort of deciding a future. Sometime in the future, this would become apparent, where Abraham, uh, he had two sons. The one was a bondmaid and the other was a free woman. But he was of the bondwoman who was born after the flesh, but he of the free woman was by promise, which things are analogy. Abraham uh, pushing Hagar out. We see there the, uh, two allegories, one being under the bondage of law and the other one under freedom or grace or free unmerited favour. So right back in the beginning, God was declaring the plan and what he had in mind for the next few thousand years. There was going to be two ways of doing things. And Abraham chose the wrong way. He was trying to help God out a bit. And thinking, Sarah, she's thinking, well, I'm too old to have any children. So maybe God's blessing is through the handmaid. So he went to Hagar, the handmaid of Sarah, and she had Ishmael. And God said, no, that woman is under bondage. I'm talking about freedom of grace or free unmerited favour, I'll do it my way. If you do it under my direction, you'll become free. God was designing the plan of, if you go down that way, you're under bondage. If you go my way, you'll become free and undertake of the grace of God. First of we'll talk about the law. So when God started, okay, well, mankind, I'm dealing with a group of people that struggle with the concepts of being good as most people even today you know I was thinking on the way up here there's lots of road works and they drive you mad but in particular I've always noticed the one down there with the Uncle Pringa bridge doing something and so we all have to slow down to 60 and I wonder how many of us do slow down to 60 unless you go really slow most people don't slow down very much at all which is the nature of mankind. And that's why God had to then say, well, we need laws. If you want to do it this way, if you want to be under the bond woman, the bond is a way of what you want to do, this is what you've got to do to come up to my expectation. And when he starts talking about, he brought in the laws, and there was only 613 of them in the Old Testament, so... Uh, we struggle to get one right. We can't always obey the speed limit. There's another 612 to go sort of thing. And if you break one law, you've broken the law in God's eyes. So here we see there was laws on moral laws, social laws, food laws, purity laws, feasts, sacrifice and offering of all sorts of things. We'll have a look at it in a moment. Instructions for the priesthood and the high priest, including tithes, Instructions regarding the tabernacle, the temple in Jerusalem, the holiest of holies, the Ark of the Covenant, Aaron's rod, the manner instructions and the construction of various altars. So there was lots of varying laws that if you want to do it the way God wants it, to become perfect in God's sight, to have his tick of approval, you've got to get all these laws correct. So he started back in Genesis chapter 47 and talking about back in Egypt, Joseph, when he was in charge there. 
and they were starting to move into the famines and so on and the people were starting to worry a bit and run out of food and so on. He brought in laws that you had to give a fifth of your crop to Pharaoh every year for the next six years that he would have this great heap of stored grains and so on for the future. He brought in that law. You read about it in Genesis 47. If we look in uh, Exodus 12, it talks there of the Passover as we would recognise and going through what they must do if you want the angel of death to pass over. You've got to do a certain amount of things and you do it correctly or it doesn't work. You will die. So this is the law that God instituted particularly in Leviticus and so on. In Leviticus chapter 6 there in verse 9 talks about the, the law of burnt offering. Verse 14 talks about the law of meat offering. Verse 25 is the law of sin offering. Chapter 7 verse 1 is the law of trespass. Chapter 7 verse 11 is the law of sacrifice. Verse 46 the law of beasts. Chapter 13 Verse 59 is the law of the plagues or leprosy, that sort of thing, what you must do if you get leprosy. So there was a whole ritual going through it, even if your house got leprosy, as it were, you had to go through a process and a ritual and sorting things out. So there was lots and lots of little things that had to be done to fulfil just simple laws of the way you deal with your house and so on and so on. We see even Leviticus chapter 10, Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, says there they took either of his censer and put fire therein and put incense therein and offered strange fire before the Lord, which he had commanded them not to. The fire went out from the Lord and devoured them and they died before the Lord because they did it their way. They brought in things that they thought, well, we can do this and we can add a bit and add a bit of their own sort of ideas and theories and so on. You weren't supposed to do that. A bit later in the chapter, they were told to eat of the sacrifice, but they didn't. They burnt it. And the Lord said, don't do that. You eat it. Because it was a certain sacrifice, a certain process they had to go through. So there was lots of different little things here and there. When we start to look in Leviticus and bringing things into place, not to drink wine or strong drink, lest you die. They may put a difference between the holy and the unholy, between the unclean and the clean. That you may teach the children of Israel all the statutes which the Lord has spoken unto them by the hand of Moses. Chapter 19, you shall not eat anything with blood. You shall not use enchantment, not observe time. You shall not round the corners of your heads. So we're supposed to have a square head, I'm not sure about that, but neither shall you mar the corners of your beard. And you shall not make cuttings on your flesh for the dead, nor print any marks upon you. I am the Lord, just some of the laws. And we see here, even on the land where they'll grow on crops and so on, the Lord said, Speak unto the children of Israel and say unto them, When you come into the land which I give you, then shall the land keep a Sabbath unto the Lord. So you can put your crop in for six years and then you rest it for 12 months. Then you start again for the next six years. When we were in New South Wales many years ago, people there somehow worked out when you should start this process and they found when they did that, on the sixth year, their crops would be quite a lot more than the fifth year. And that's the way it was. And the Lord said, if you do it this way, the Lord would bless the sixth year and you would have sufficient for the seventh year, which you rested. So the land would actually be looked after. It could rest and not be just abused. On the other side, people down in Bory Creek, as I mentioned now and again, one particular farmer, for many years, his father and then him were cropping the same paddock year after year putting in wheat and eventually the soil became like talcum powder and that went that hard they actually couldn't plough it anymore so it was ruined. It took probably 10 or 12 years for it to eventually get back into some sort of use again. So the Lord had laws to cover those sorts of things. You look after the land, you look after your animals and so on. And it says there, six years you shall sow and on the seventh year shall be a Sabbath of rest. 
in Deuteronomy and chapter 5 and so on that talks about the Ten Commandments. That's one that people sort of try and keep. Oh, I keep the Ten Commandments. Well, yeah, good on you, but you've got 603 to go, sort of thing, you know. But that was what the Lord's sort of set up to say, if you want to follow me under the bondwoman, under the law, this is what you've got to do. Pretty simple. All manner of trust. So if you go onto another person's place and something's lost, you're in trouble. You come before the judges and you have to pay then double back to the neighbour. So don't wander onto your neighbour's place and take his stuff. Leviticus 19 verse 19 provides rules about clothing, which we don't particularly keep these days. You keep my statue, thou shalt not let thy cattle gender with diverse kind. And that's when you look into the cattle industry, they're always different crosses and trying to get the perfect meat cow or whatever and there's all sorts of cattle you know when when we had them we had about half a dozen now there's probably a hundred different varieties of cattle different shapes and sizes and colors and so on and in those days the lord said don't do that you should not sow the field with mingled seed so if you're putting wheat in you put wheat in you don't put other things but now all sorts of things are crossing i was reading in the magazine this morning land magazine from new south wales that they now have dogs you can smell weeds and go around and you can pick out particular weeds in your crop or whatever so they don't mingle the seeds. The Lord said don't do that right back then. You don't need herbicides, you don't need all those things. Just don't mix the seeds. It's pretty simple. And don't mingle your garments. So you don't have linen and wool. We do that all the time these days. But the Lord in those days, don't do that. It's against the rules. To keep it perfect, it's either linen or it's wool in this situation. But we, because of the pricing and so on, we like to change it. In Leviticus we see when you're doing an offering, you don't burn yeast or honey with it. And you're in trouble if you fail to put salt on the offering to God. Because if salt has lost its savour, men cast it out. So there's little things that the Lord had right back in the beginning about the law that we read about in the New Testament. That it all fits in, talking about the salt and so on. Eating fat. At once a lasting ordinance for the generations to come. Wherever you live, all the fat is to be saved for an offering to God. We're not supposed to eat it. But it's always the best part, isn't it? Um, you're not supposed to eat blood either. Here we go, there's a few others. Letting your hair become unkempt. I don't have any trouble with that. Otherwise you will die. Particularly a lot of these are relating to the priesthood. But it was the law that God set out. Tearing your clothes. You don't sort of rip your clothes or get caught in a barbed wire fence or something. You're in trouble. Drinking alcohol in a holy place. You will die. As I say, relating a lot to the priesthood. Eating any animal which doesn't both chew the cud and has a divided hoof. Like a cow chews the cud and has got a cloven foot. You get a camel, choose the cud, but it doesn't have a cloven foot, so you don't eat camels. Leave them alone. And that was the idea under the food law. There's lots of different ones uh, with fish and all sorts of bits and pieces you can read about in the Old Testament. But it was just one of the things that was there. We see here just one of the little things that happened there where the Ark of the Covenant was taken away. The Philistines given it back and Dave went to collect it and then David decided to bring it back and he was very happy about it, played under the Lord, all sorts of instruments made of fir wood, even the harps, the psalteries and the cornets and the cymbals. And when they came to Nacon's threshing floor, Uzzah put forth his hand to the Ark of God and took hold of it for the oxen shook. It was a good idea, hold it up so it didn't fall off and break, sounded good, didn't it? But... The anger of the Lord was kindled against him and God smote him there for his error and there he died by the ark of God. Pretty harsh, but that's the rule. Don't touch what the Lord said, don't touch. If you touch it, you'll die. In our thinking, it was a good idea to support it and so it wouldn't fall off the cart and so on. God said, don't touch. And that was the law he was dealing with. Also, even in the midst of all that, God had 
what he called the cities of refuge. And particularly in the book of Numbers, talking about cities of refuge, that the sire may flee hither, which killeth any person unawares. We would sort of generally comment these days and say it was sort of like manslaughter. If you killed somebody you didn't mean to, sort of thing, you'd run them over with your car, or in those days your camel or something, and you'd inadvertently killed them. You could run to one of these cities before the family of the one that was killed could get hold of you. Once you got into the city, you were safe until the high priest of the day, when he died, you were free. You could go back home. That was the law. So God created six cities around about. We see that's where they were. Some on that side and some on this side. Hebron, Shechem, Kadesh, Colon, Ramoth, Gilead and Bezer. So there was each side of the River Jordan and so on. There was a city you could run to to be safe for the moment. But if you decided to go out and see what was going on and the family were around, they could grab you and kill you. And that was lawful. But God was trying to show his benevolence, I suppose, or his grace. There was, in all that law, a place for God's grace. We see God's kindness, his gracious generosity, his undeserved favour and spiritual blessing. The Apostle Paul wrote in Ephesians, For by grace you are saved through faith, and not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works. So we're talking here of the free woman, not the bond woman. So we're talking about freedom and grace and free unmerited favour. Something that we can't do. That's why Abraham and Sarah decided we can't work this out so we'll, we'll have a child through Hagar. That'll work. It'll be Abraham's son. But God said, no, that's not what I said. It's my favour. It's my unverited favour, undeserved favour, my generosity, my graciousness, my grace. And that's what he was trying to sort of identify with, with Abraham. Not that way, Abraham. Even though Abraham was a friend of God, you don't do it that way. My grace is sufficient, as Paul wrote a bit later on, for you. As God said when Paul was struggling with this and that, the Lord said, my grace is sufficient. Don't worry about what's going on in your life. Don't worry about whether you're crook or something's against you or whatever. Don't worry about that. My grace is sufficient. And so God was here, he's starting to sort of head to where he wanted to get with mankind. The law they found out was no good. It didn't work. Mankind couldn't keep the law that God had set up. It was perfect but we're dealing with people that are not perfect and can't do it properly. In John's Gospel, in chapter 1, verse 14, the Word was made flesh, dwelt amongst us, and we beheld his glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. John, bearing witness of him, and cried, saying, This was he of whom I spake. He that cometh after me is preferred before me, for he was before me. And of his fullness have we all received, and grace for grace. For the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. Jesus came on the scene as the word of God. Jesus was the word made flesh, as we read, and grace was being brought in. And the fullness which we have received is his grace. In Matthew chapter 5, Jesus is saying, You think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets? I am not come to destroy, but to fulfil. For very I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till it all be fulfilled. So, how does this happen? How can this work? The law is fulfilled. God's not going to do away with it. It's just a different approach. And this is where God, right back in the beginning with Abraham, God's plan was starting to unfold. And Jesus arrived and he said, I'm not going to do away with the law. I'm going to fulfill it. If I say, except your righteousness exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you shall no case enter into the kingdom of God. So their righteousness was hopeless because they murdered the Son of God. But he said, you've got to be better than that. But he went on to say, You have heard that it was said unto them of old time, Thou shalt not kill, 
and whosoever shall kill shall be in danger of judgment. And if you kill someone, you get killed yourself, an eye for an eye and so on and so on. That was the law. But I say unto you that whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of judgment. Whosoever shall say unto his brother, Raka, thou fool, shall be in danger of a council. But whosoever shall say thou fool shall be in danger of hellfire. Therefore, if thou bring thy gift to the altar, and then remembers that thy brother has aught against thee, leave there thy gift before the altar, go thy way, first be reconciled to thy brother, and then come and offer the gift. Jesus was starting to point what we need to do. It's not about keeping the law. God was actually bringing it down to the individual. You can't be angry with your brother. If you want to come before me... Go and sort it out. So God was now bringing it down to an individual basis, one-on-one, -on -one, right back into the Garden of Eden with Adam and Eve, or Adam and God, walking around in the cool of the evening. God was bringing it right back to them, and Jesus was setting the way from there back to an individual. In John chapter 8, the scribes and the Pharisees brought unto Jesus a woman taken in adultery, when they set her in the midst, they said unto him, Master, this woman was taken in adultery in the very act. And now Moses and the Lord commanded thou shalt be stoned, but what sayest thou? So they continued asking him, he lifted up himself and said unto them, He that was without sin among you, let him first cast a stone at her. And when they had heard it, they being convicted of their own conscience, went out one by one, beginning at the eldest, even unto the last, and Jesus was left alone and the woman standing in the midst. When Jesus had lifted him up himself and saw none but the woman, he said unto her, Woman, where are those accusers? Has no man condemned thee? She said, No man, Lord. And Jesus said unto her, Neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. Don't do it again, sort of thing. And this is where the grace of God was starting to be fulfilled. They decided wrongly to bring the lady before Jesus as the judge they didn't bring the man of course back in the Old Testament both were stoned to death in adultery but they brought the woman well it's her fault maybe the man was one of the Pharisees I don't know or one of their mates but they were supposed to bring them both and they were both stoned to death if you want the letter of the law and Jesus said to them Okay, he who's kept the law perfectly, way you go, is a stone, go and throw it at her. And none of them could. And they knew that, Jesus knew that. But he said to her, I don't condemn you, go your way and don't do it again. And that's when they were starting to bring in the difference between a law to a nation to now an individual, one-on-one -on -one with God. Here we read in Galatians, Paul writing, Brethren, you've been called unto liberty, only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one another. And as Paul was recognising, this was the difference. We serve one another, for all the law is fulfilled in one word, even this, thou shalt love thy neighbour as thyself. If you love your neighbour, you're not going to kill them. You're not going to covet their stuff etc. So if you love your neighbour, obviously you love the Lord your God first of all and all that, but the second one, the love thy neighbour, you're automatically, if you love your neighbour as you should, you fulfil the law. And really that's what he was saying, the law is fulfilled in one sentence, love your neighbour, and it's done. Even so in verse 3, we were children in bondage under the elements of the world, but when the fullness of time come, God sent forth his son, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law, that they might receive the adoption of sons. And because you are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Wherefore thou art no more a servant, but a son, if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. This is the difference, and this is where God wanted to get, right back in the beginning. We couldn't fulfil the law, but... God sent his son, made of the woman, made under the law, to redeem you and I. That we might become, instead of a nation that follow God, 
as an individual, one-on-one, -on -one, a son and daughter of the living God. And that's what God always wanted. And because the law was broken by Adam and Eve, God had to come up with a different plan, another plan. And right from Abraham, right from the beginning there, the bond woman and the free woman, he started to separate. And we're talking here, Galatians again, quite a bit about these sorts of things in Galatians. Now we, brethren, as Isaac was, are the children of promise of the free woman. But as then he was born after the flesh, persecuted him that was born after the spirit. Ishmael and Isaac didn't get on well. And that's why Abraham kicked her out. Even so it is now. Nevertheless, what saith the scripture? Cast out the bond woman and her son. Get rid of their old life. That's what he was talking about here. The flesh, the things that we think, I can help God do this, as Abraham and Sarah did. I can help sort this out. I can have... Hagar is my wife, if you like, and we can have a son, we'll call him Ishmael, and that'll set up the future as God wanted. And the God said, no, that's not the way it was. And, and he was saying to you and I, get rid of that thinking. That's the law. That's the rules. Get rid of those. Cast out the bondwoman and her son. For the son of bondwoman shall not be heir with the son of the free woman. So then, brethren, we are not children of the bondwoman, but of the free. That's where we start to see what God has done in our life. Galatians again, stand fast therefore in the liberty wherein Christ has made us free and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Behold, I, Paul, say unto you that if you be circumcised, Christ shall profit you nothing. For I testify again to every man that is circumcised that he is a debtor to the whole law of you. That's the way you want to do it. If you want to go under the law and be entangled again in your yoke of bondage, you've got to do it to the whole law. You've got to do 613 laws or you don't qualify. Christ is become of no effect unto you. Whosoever of you are justified by the law, you are fallen from grace. So Paul recognised the law is not going to do you any good. We've fallen from grace if that's what you're going to do. And we're talking in Romans that Paul wrote again, therefore there's no, now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus who work not after the flesh but after the spirit. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. So Jesus Christ brought in this new way, this way of grace, the way of free unmerited favour. We see that whatever our situation is, that we can, if we want to be clever and good, we can keep the law, and I say good luck to you to do that because we can't even keep one law in the state and that's to drive at the required speed limit all the time. Who has done that? Hands up. There you go, you see. We can't even keep one law in the state of South Australia. God's law had 613, but now... There's the law of grace, if you like. Free unmerited favour. God has right from the beginning wanted to have this situation that he can call us sons and daughters. He can call us his children. And he did that by sending his son and paying the price that by his sacrifice the grace of God can now be shed abroad in this world. The love of God can be shared abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost. And that's why we need the Holy Ghost. That's why we have to have it within. Because if we haven't got the Holy Ghost, we're under the law. Jesus said unto all of us, if you're burdened, heavy laden, you're labouring, you're troubled, life seems to be very hard and whatever, he said, you come unto me, I'll give you the rest. I'll give you the Sabbath. I'll give you that time that you can stop from doing what you think you have to do to be a good Christian. Or you think you're going to have to do something to get into the kingdom. That mankind wants to run around and try and establish a way of doing things. And you can go down the Nadab and Abihu, I think that's what they're called, two fellows, we'll do it this way. We don't want to be involved in your sacrifices, Aaron. Daddy, whatever you want to call him, 
we'll do it our way, we'll add a bit more and take a bit away, etc, etc. The end will result, they died. That's what happens. And mankind today, they want to add a bit, they want to take a bit away, they want to make things up themselves and this is the fire of God, this is how God likes it. God said, no, you do it my way or you're out the door. Pretty simple. And Jesus said, all you need to do is come unto him. He is the way, the truth and the life. He will send you to the Father. The Holy Ghost, you can pray to the Father through Jesus Christ. The Spirit makes intercession for us. It talks about it in Romans chapter 8. And Acts chapter 1 are talking about Jesus saying, don't go anywhere until you get filled with the Holy Ghost. Don't go anywhere until uh, uh, you have the power of God within. And Acts chapter 2, the, in the next one he talks about, on the day of Pentecost, they were filled with the Holy Ghost speaking in tongues and he said, this is what you've got to do. Repent, to be baptised, be filled with the Holy Ghost. That's the requirement. It's as simple as that. Don't try and be smart and do your own thing. Do it God's way. Be a free person through the free woman and get rid of the old way of life, all the people said.